as we have been continuing in our study of the Apostles' Creed, we come to that very interesting, I find a very interesting phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's all it says, right? The Holy Spirit. And you're like, what's the importance that they said that in the Creed? Of believing in the Holy Spirit. I mean, after all, isn't it the fact that we worship God as our Creator and Jesus as God's Son enough for Christians? Should we as Christians kind of move our crosses kind of over a little bit and put some symbols of the Holy Spirit up on our walls? Uh, like a dove or tongues of fire? They kind of say Presbyterians have that burning bush symbol, right? As our kind of emblem or our logo. Should we do that? Remember, it was Jesus who told Christians that we should baptize each other in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Apostle Peter told those first crowd gathered around him the day the Holy Spirit kind of came upon the followers of Jesus. He said, repent and be baptized, right? Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you, even you, I can sense him saying, even you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to those, he says, who repent of their sins turning to the forgiveness that Jesus offers. God always is giving us gifts as Christians. It's as a gift, though. It's not something that we can earn, can we? It's a gift. The Spirit is freely given to us. And we're to receive that gift of the Spirit for now. I've been reflecting a lot on gifts. And I was even, I was doing a study on my home as a gift. And sometimes you feel maybe I want to open my home to others and everything. And I was reminded as a gift, it's there for me to use as I see best. There's no strings attached with gifts. There's no obligation it's a gift. And it's up for me to what I want to do. Jesus was clear that the gift of the Holy Spirit will counsel us, teach us all things, and remind us of Jesus and everything he spoke to us. In a sense, Jesus is saying that without the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are missing in your life a person that's there to guide and counsel you. You won't be able to understand spiritual realities. And we will not be able to remember and keep our attention and focus in our lives on Jesus and what he's done for us. Put it this way. I see the role of the Holy Spirit as essential in our lives. So we don't live kind of as orphans, abandoned by God, to fend for ourselves. But most importantly, with our being filled with the Holy Spirit, we have an empowering presence to guide us, to teach us spiritual realities, and to fill us with the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Now, this is important for us people that are teachers of God's word, that we need to remember that we need the Spirit's power in our lives to work in people's hearts to teach them God's truth. I could stop right now and I could really firmly believe, do I really firmly believe as a pastor that God through his spirit is speaking to each of you right now. I know that's going beyond, that he's speaking to other churches and their pastors through their message and reading of the word. And let's go even farther. He's in other towns. He's in other nations. 
It's across the world. Even maybe Antarctica at the South Pole right now. That the, there might even be people there worshiping God. God's Spirit could be everywhere at one time. Paul came to realize in his life, the Apostle Paul, that the real struggle in life isn't against flesh and blood, but he said against spiritual forces that are too powerful for us to know how to even see and figure out or defeat on our own. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's empowering presence that takes up residence in our hearts to help us understand those realities. Jesus, earlier in chapter 14, says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching, of course. But my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. What a great promise. It is the Holy Spirit that ministers in us that God wants to make his home with us. This joy of the Lord. One of the fruits of the Spirit is joy in our lives. But it's God's joy coming into us. Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Roman Church, chapter 8, verse 15, teaches that the Holy Spirit cries out within a believer, Abba, Papa! Gordon Fee stresses that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we live, in a sense, in the very presence of God. A God whom is three in one, in an eternal fellowship of love. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in the name of Jesus, is the Spirit who leads our lives into the truth of who God is in life. Our body then becomes God's temple, where the Spirit loves. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace is given you. Liam Morris points out that the Greeks tended to view peace essentially negative, as the opposite of war. But for the Hebrew people, peace was a positive blessing. Especially, it was considered having a right relationship with God. That's when Jesus says, my peace, I give you. It's not the absence of war, but it's that right relationship with God. That home, that dwelling of God's Spirit within us. The joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord being with us. That right relationship, that someone in my life that will never leave me or forsake me. That will hold me fast. That can be in all situations, at all times, and in all places. The Spirit's mission is to help us to understand how to have that right relationship with God through Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a gift of God, bringing us into fellowship with God. This is important. The Holy Spirit does not have a separate agenda than the Christ revealed in the Scriptures. There isn't a new Christ coming that is different than the Jesus we read about in the Bible. There's no new revelation that's going to come if it takes us away from Jesus. Let me give you an example. Mrs. Smith really believed that God was talking to her through the Holy Spirit. She heard God speaking to her through the Spirit to let the water flow into her life to overflowing. The problem with this advice was that Mrs. Smith took this advice literally. She started her bathtub and kept the water running until it had flooded the whole house. Sometimes these kind of following these voices can be tragic for people. As two, as two young people thought they heard the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And they were trying to get from their village to another village when they came up against a roaring river. Undaunted, these two young people claim that through the power of the Holy Spirit, they can have power of God's power to walk on water. With a leap of faith, the two young people stepped into the river only to be swept away by the strong current and both drowned. 
You know, an important truth to remember is that Jesus told Peter to come and walk on the water, didn't he? And Jesus hadn't spoken to the two young people. The key principle is that the guidance of the Holy Spirit will always point us to who? To Jesus. And the principles and teaching in God's Word. So God's not, Holy Spirit is not going to give you some kind of weird leading that is against the principles of God's scripture or against the teaching of Jesus. So a good question is to ask ourselves is when we feel prompted by the spiritual realities, is, is it consistent in how we are to live in the Bible? So in other words, the Holy Spirit isn't going to ask you to commit murder because it is God and the Holy Spirit who gives us life. And God's word, of course, teaches that murder is wrong. That's a simple example. But sometimes the guidance is harder to, to sort out than others. But if we hold to the testimony of God's word and the principles of the Bible, God's spirit will guide us. But that's our heart to hold to that. I had a friend a while back that was asking me what I thought about a certain healing technique, whether it was okay for Christians to participate in it. I won't go into all the details, but the healing technique required some mystical meditation that could only be performed by some special person trained in the technique. Actually, my friend was not really asking for my honest perspective, but really wanted my blessing. There's a difference. My friend was suffering. And I really wanted my friend's suffering eased. But there was a catch inside of me that concerned me. I thought of the verse in 1 Corinthians 6 kind of came to mind. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. So as I prayed about the situation that my friend was involved in and searched for the teaching of the Bible, I was drawn to the fact that we can do something and we can pray to God, asking for healing, whether we are in the same room as a suffering person or not. And we have to, don't really need to have any special training to do that, do we? We have the Spirit of God that cries within us even when we don't know the right words to speak with our mind. How quickly we forget the gift of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Don't we? One of the visual symbols of the Holy Spirit is that tongues of fire, right, that came down upon the followers of Jesus that first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Paul later teaches Timothy, he says something, he says, fan into flame the gift of the Holy that was given to him. Fanning into flame, getting that fire burning hot, right? Getting that roaring fire, that's what we want for our fire. Well, what good is a gift we don't receive it and let the gift of God's Holy Spirit really work in our lives the teaching of Jesus. If we receive a gift and we leave it on the shelf just to collect dust. No, no marriage relationship would do well that way. So why do we think our relationship with God and the Spirit would do any better? A fire must be fed, right? And the burning coals need to be fanned in the flame. They need to be longed for. They need to be yearned for. They need to realize this is what it needs to come into flame, right? We need that. I love this great old hymn by Charles Wesley. It's called, O Thou Who Camest From Above. The fire celestial to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love 
on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze, and trembling to its source return in humble and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up the gift in me. Charles Wesley was so gifted. <laughs> Obviously, I think if he were here to say it was God's spirit inspiring him. <laughs> I should, I would love to have some of that inspiration in life, wouldn't you? <laughs> There's so much more we could share about the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I encourage you to have a longing once again in your life to rediscover the gift that God has for you, that Jesus has for you. Yeah, there's fruit that comes from God's Spirit that He wants to bring forth in your life. And the Holy Spirit gives every believer spiritual gifts to equip us and give us a purpose in life. My prayer is for all of us to not be distracted or persuaded by wise and persuasive words, but realize ultimately we are seeking together and we're journeying together. We might stumble together as well. What it means when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Maybe we can journey together, not relying on our own human wisdom, but realize that there's a freedom that as followers of Jesus we have a gift. And he's here to counsel us, to guide us, to teach us, and to give us even the power to proclaim to, like we say in our creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up as we do our prayer. Um,